a, I mean, often with people with trauma, there's like this like limit point where they're having a they're having interceptive experiences. It's hard to know. I mean, we could theorize a lot of different things, but she's mm-hmm. she's no longer sort of safe, right? Her her mind is now doing something. Wants her to be doing something else. <laughs> mm-hmm. Clearly, so I I wouldn't call it a release. I would call no. it more like your mind saying no mm-hmm. and then there's a lot of now you're here right so what I do I mean I think this is where you're going tell me if I'm not going the right place um what I do is I go very incrementally so sometimes what that means is I have clients experience those things with me and not at home or like sort of like longer ones with me shorter ones at home sometimes I sort of extend the time really slowly um it's a little tricky you know Mm -hmm. sometimes I switch the practice to get them to do something longer that doesn't trigger that and then go back to it I mean there's lots of ways to do things so it's what you want to do so because the whole thing with trauma is that she feels like she has agency over the experience so none of it's a problem she's not going to die from trembling in her body right so when she says to you sometimes I feel like I want to explore it your answer should be okay like that's totally up to you if you feel unsafe or like it's not working for you do this so these are your options so now she's got the optionality thing which is okay the entire basis of all trauma sensitive things and it might be a good thing you know these these systems where you work through things they're not bad. They just sometimes don't have the proper off ramps. Like they're trying mm-hmm. to get somewhere fast, you know? Um, so I think it's okay to say that you should always be thinking these words, like that's entirely up to you. Like, mm-hmm. cause it might be a good thing. Cause she's still feeling her body and all the things you want. Right. Yep. It might be it might be a good thing for her as long as she's not so triggered it's going to have some big effect. So, it doesn't sound like from your description unless I'm like her having an unpleasant experience is not the same as it not being okay for her. Okay. Not not okay is like I couldn't sleep, I'm scared, I didn't leave my house the next day. I've been having mm-hmm. nightmares for four days, whatever. Having a uh, sort of adverse experience for 10 minutes is fine, as long as that's what it is. So you might want to just investigate that with her yeah. and and do what you're doing. Say, here's how you get out of it. Here's when you leave. And when you don't, you get to decide. Because really, if she has in her mind that she can decide and it's completely choose your own right. adventure for her then you're totally winning. So, so somatic experiencing work is is awesome. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. But you need to do it with somebody who like knows what they're doing. Yeah. But it's very, uh, it's not the same thing at all, but it's like sort of akin to EMDR and its results. You know, you, the therapist will um, sort of encourage you to generate a feeling in your body based on like a past experience or something and Mm then um, stay with it. And then eventually what happens is that feeling kind of dissipates or moves and your brain, the theory is, but I've actually done this myself and it worked. um, The, the brain now is storing that memory in a, in a place where it can process it. That's the theory and it, it works definitely works so um, it might be a really good thing for her but she'll be better off with the practitioner that's what I was asking who can kind of like talk to her about what's happening and be there with her and then those practitioners are I mean in the U.S. I don't know I mean they're almost always therapists but it's like it's sort of like you have a therapist in the room with you you know Mm -hmm. because a lot of stuff comes up and there could be moments where a little cognitive processing could be really helpful Um, but the shoulder it's a it's funny because most of the diagnoses don't help you that much, you know, because 
you're going to do all the same things. <laughs> you know? So you're going to plug in that shoulder. You're going to strengthen the lats and the rear delts. You're going to do range of motion work. You're going to mirror is good. Like, so you ever do the good one. And then sometimes the, the one that's not, doesn't have as much range of motion follows suit a little, um, all the things we were talking about. Yeah. Um, but people's, this is what happens when the, the greatest hits, are your rear deltoid and your latissimus muscles. Like when they, and it's really the muscles of your back body, right? Because that's not a natural thing when you're sedentary or whatever to work if you're not lifting anything up, if you're not pulling ever. So over time, you see this all the time, you know? And so when you go to the doctor, I mean, just for you and your head, like they look in there, you know, they see if the rotator cuff is torn, they see if there's inflammation, they can see, you know, there's lots of things. But in the end, they can't do anything for you unless you're going to get surgery. And unless it's a very big deal, surgery usually is not your best option in the shoulder. So I'm saying all that. So, so you're doing the right thing, right? Like yeah. you're, you're helping her, but you know, you just, you can't go through the pain. So you got to find, we were talking last time about some more like isometric kind of holds to get things stronger, right? So you can't always be moving it like you do. Like if you do Cobra and you stay in Cobra, that's an isometric hold, right? right? You're you're basically engaging all your muscles. Okay, that's you what know. I- Yeah, you're not moving all the time. Yeah. You would think, I mean, they both have their place, but, but a lot of times when someone's injured, it's like you find a place where you can work and you have them work there and that's the isometric part. And that does work. Okay. Like that does work to strengthen the muscles like the in concepts of building muscles right you have like the weight you're lifting even if it's body weight right like when you put your arm like that you're lifting your arms weight and then you have what they call like time under tension which is just how long the muscle is firing for and so they both help the muscles grow and and work better so when people are hurt a lot like they have you know when someone's like really injured you go to the PT and they put those electro stimulation things on you. And that's, that's the same thing. It's an isometric, it, it fires and your muscle goes till it's done because you can't move. <laughs> so they're going to do it for you. So it's the same. If you do this in your chair and you squeeze your shoulder blades together and you hold it, eventually you start to get tired. And it's when you're getting near that fatigue that you're really building strength. And also, you know, if you're a weightlifter, they, it's also volume. So if I do this a hundred times, right, that's also going to build strength. The problem is with body weight is that going like this is is not that hard. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes, like working o- away from gravity is not that hard. But if I'm on the floor and I do salabasa like this and I hold it, you know, it gets it gets hard pretty fast, right? <laughs> like thirty seconds later, you're like, this is really hard. <laughs> right, and that's good because that's gonna that's gonna get those shoulder muscles to be stronger, um, and have the ability to hold her in proper alignment. Because you really, you're asking her to do things in proper alignment, but she doesn't have the muscles to do it, right? So any yeah. good yoga therapist will be like, this is where I want you to feel it, right? Like I want you to feel it. Like you know, explain like, you know, I want you to feel it in your, between your shoulder blades and in your lats, you know, I want you to be sort of fighting gravity and I want it to get hard. Like, that's what I would say. And they're like, Oh, and I don't care. I don't have to say, I I'm just doing, it. but like, you know, it doesn't matter how high you come up like at all. <laughs> like you can come up a half an inch, right? It doesn't matter. As long as those muscles are firing. Cool. But this little rear deltoid, if you don't do anything to work it, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, okay. it needs, it needs, it needs input. The other right. possibility, I just want to throw this out there, you know, and in addition, you know, people get upper cross syndrome from being like this. So she has tight pecs and all those things. So you can stretch them, just like lesson 14 stuff, but just remember to keep strengthening those weak muscles like all the time. I can't emphasize enough. Like, I can't tell you how many people I've seen in pain that have tried all sorts of things that you strengthen their muscles and the pain goes away. Like, people are too weak. In this case, like, what the breathing does is keeps the nervous system. So strength has 
multiple components, but it's really the functionality of your brain talking to your muscles. So you have the actual muscles themselves, but then you also have how your nervous system functions. And so what you want is the nervous system to be pretty calm while doing these strengthening exercises. And that's the yoga superpower. Cause like we teach them how to breathe, like take six long, slow, deep breaths while you hold this, which is very different than the PT where they're like, hold this it still works. That's what I'm saying. You could just say, hold this and her muscles will still get stronger and that will work. But if you add the breath component, then what you're doing is making it so that she can work longer or harder without her mm. nervous system giving up on her. The way you really see that, like with athletes, that's, I don't know, for me, this is really interesting. I like exercise science. Like someone like a professional power lifter who puts like, you know, 700 pounds on their back or whatever and does a squat. Lots of people could do that muscularly, but very few people can do it nervous system wise. Like you're, you have to train your nervous system to handle the input. And that's a lot of their work. And it's really interesting when you read about how these people train, because it's like somehow you have to be able to put 700 pounds on your back, squat really slowly and stand back out without your nervous system just basically being like, no, <laughs> which, you know, I could not do that, you know? So it's like this long years process to get there. But what's, I think what's kind of interesting is it is about your muscles, but it's not a, it's not as much about your muscles as you think, you know, it's also about your nervous system. So anyway, in our world, it's the same thing, but that's what's so cool about yoga, right? Like you, you see these like masters of asana and they're like, doing hard poses and they they're just kind of smiling and they look like they're sipping a cup of tea it's like really amazing to watch their nervous system is like everything is a hundred percent okay right now i'm doing a one-handed handstand and they're like talking to you and we think to ourselves oh it's just because they're strong it's not it's like their mental state and their nervous system state is very different than what it would look like if i attempted a one-handed handstand <laughs> Yeah, I mean, shaking and sweating and not talking to you, you know, because <laughs> my nervous system would be freaking out. Think about, I mean, there's a lot of factors and we talk about this a lot, but one easy way to think about it is like, what does a like therapist say or a private pay PT or something like that charge for an hour? You know, something like kind of comparable. And that's usually, well, I don't know. I'm in the Northeast. I, I can't tell you. And then, you know, you can move that around a lot, but um, another paradigm that might be helpful is if you had 20 clients a week, which is a full practice, because you can't, 20 clients a week will take you 40 hours to deal with. That's how much you'd be making per year. So you can think about it that way. You know what I mean? So your needs are what they are. So, you know, if you charge $50 an hour, that's $1,000 a week. You take a two week vacation and always have 20 and never have 18, you'll make 50, but more likely you'd make like 25 or 30. And that's not a lot of money in most places, right? That's not really a great salary. So that's another way to look at it. If you're just looking at it from your personal um, way of looking at it. Um, and, you know, I said all these things in the lessons, but we don't get health insurance. We don't get retirement plans. We don't get pensions, right? We get nothing. So um that's why you see those prices like and i would say for most people i'm talking to and like in our practicums they're in the ones like depending on where they live like 120 to 180 seems to be like a normal range well i'm saying all this to say try to look at it very practically like what would i make you know if you're trying to do it for a living how much do you need and the other thing that goes into my pricing is that i robin hood everything so i like to work with people without money so the reason I have the rate I have is because I reserve part of my practice for low income people. Pricing is super interesting. I think it's I, it's kind of fascinating. This is an important thing. It's like, how do you do it equitably if you're trying to make a living and you want to serve as many people as possible? So you have to decide like what portion of your practice is going to be under your full rate. That's all. That's, that's what I do. But I, I think normal would be what do people pay for sort of these types of services? 
You know what I mean? Like one-on-one acupuncture appointments, one-on-one therapy appointments, like these kinds of services that, you know, acupuncturists have graduate degrees, therapists have graduate degrees, you know, you're in school for however long you're in school, you know, learning things. So that's how Mm -hmm. I think about it. It's not all about money. Obviously, nobody does this for money. Like this is a terrible way to make tons of money if you came here to make us millions of dollars you you picked the wrong profession but um don't be afraid to charge people don't mind paying for things that are useful to them they do they don't so i just want to remind you 